Who here is the designated prayer for your family? Anyone else? When you sit down for the, the family meal, you get, you get the turkey on the table, you are the designated prayer, that, that's your job, right? You're the one who has to say a few words. It tends to be an inherited, inherited position, doesn't it? It tends to pass down that way. In my family, it is probably not a surprise to you that I am the designated public prayer. And as many of you have heard me pray before a meal, I don't tend to get long-winded. Thank you, Jesus, for this meal. Amen. I don't see much need to say much else before a meal. Um, I have actually had the request before. I've had an aunt ask me once, can you dress that up a bit? You know, you've been to seminary. Can you make that sound a little bit more, you know what you're trying to get at. <laughs> but I keep on giving my short little simple prayers before meals. I figure if you want to hear me speak at greater length, come on a Sunday. You'll hear me at, at, at great length. And uh, no one steps up to take my spot. That's how it goes, right? Once you're the prayer, that's your position for life. Not because of some divine decree, but because no one else wants to do it, right? No one else wants to be the prayer. And it's interesting how much we get nervous about praying in front of others. It, this was even the case uh, in seminary. You'd go out to eat with your friends, who are a bunch of other people about to be pastors. You'd think of any group... Someone in that group would be okay praying. And no, no, we'd sit at the table before a meal, and uh, they played this game. And the last person to get your thumbs up on the table had to pray. And, and I refused to play because I'm ornery. And, uh, and so I'd always pray, and I'd pray my short little prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for the food. Amen. And then we'd eat. So I, I got what I wanted. We prayed, and we, we ate fast. I figured there's no reason to let the meat get cold. It is striking to me that we worry so much about praying in front of others. Are we worried that we're going to misspeak? Are we afraid that uh, we're going to offend someone? Are we going to not sound Christian enough? Y'all are familiar with the Christian ease that we have, right? The sort of, I was in the South for four years, and I developed a little bit of an allergy to it. You ever hear the phrase, oh Lord, we just want to? Oh, Lord, we just want to. But if you say it quick enough in prayers, it becomes one, one sort of refrain. Oh, Lord, we just want to. And, and I just started twitching when I would hear that because there was this sort of like Christian-ish way of praying that was so formal and stilted. Don't say, oh, Lord, just want to. We just want to. Just do it. Right? I, just, I, I was not meant to be in the South, as we all could probably figure out. Um, but the impact uh, of, of all of this is that uh, we are not arguing to get to the front to pray in public. It's not what it once was. In Jesus' day, uh, it was a bit different. As we read in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is warning people about actions and intentions lining up. And if you remember last week, he talked about uh, giving in an ostentatious way. If I wanted to, to buy more forgiveness from God, I could go to a water seller, give him $500, and then he would give away $500 worth of water to whoever was coming by. And then whenever you came up to receive your gift of water, the person receiving the gift would look at the person who had bought the gift, standing there, very obviously the person who gave it, and say, God forgive your sins, it will giver of water, right? And so there was that very ostentatious way of praying, or of, uh, of giving, such that everyone would, would know who it was that was giving, and Jesus warns that those who give in this fashion have received all they're going to get out of that. A little bit of public acknowledgement, but they're not really doing much. In the same way, that's how prayer was seen, right? In the same way that people would give ostentatiously so that it would burnish their reputation and they'd look really good, people sought to pray like that in, in that first century. And so people would show up at the equivalent of the biggest church at their biggest service in the biggest town they could get to so that they could pray. Right? They'd be arguing over who could give the pastoral prayer at church. And, and then throughout the week, people would be like bickering over, can I bless the meal at the, at the Elks when they had a gathering? Or whatever the social events were, they'd be arguing over who could bless the meal so that they could get up front and look good when praying. Now this is not to say that uh, 
prayer in public is wrong, just like giving to others, just like fasting, when it's done for the right purpose, it is a good and holy thing, but we give out of love of neighbor, not because we want to be seen doing good. We, we fast because we're so caught up in, in, in getting approaching something fast. We get so caught up in what matters that we, we just don't worry as much about eating. We lose track of that and just skip lunch. right? And, and so in the same way, public prayer is a good thing when done with the right intention. And we see it happening in the book of Acts. Right In the book of Acts, we see it when uh, they have to replace Judas. They want to replace Judas, and, and it is a good thing that they prayed to replace the, the 12th disciple. They also prayed for the welfare of Peter when Peter was in jail. And if I end up, ever end up in jail, I would humbly request, please pray for me right? publicly. Get together and pray for me. I'll probably need it. So public prayer is not a, a bad thing. It just needs to be done uh, in, in, with a, the right intention. And so to this day, we have public prayer. We'll engage in it in a bit. We will gather the joys, the concerns, the faiths and hopes of our community, and we will offer them in prayer. And, and those of us who dare to pray in public, it would serve us well to attend to what Jesus teaches here, that we pray because it is the joys and concerns of the people, not because we want to look good. But for most people, the particular warning that Jesus offers here, the warning about praying for attention, is just really not uh, a warning we particularly need. I doubt that there are many, I, it is not my experience that many of you are knocking me down to get up here so you can pray before I do. If you do, you're welcome to the mic, but uh, <laughs> that, that's not a warning we need. I think the more common temptation of the 21st century is to doubt whether prayer is practical, needed, or even worth the time. I was listening to uh, some stories told by a church consultant, someone who uh, goes and helps churches and their leadership be healthier to do better work. Um, and he tells a sto some stories about how he, a church that wants to reach new people, uh, he asks them, are you praying to reach new people? Or a church that wants to get along better with its pastor, he would tell them, are you praying for your pastor daily? And, and afterwards, he has caught flack be because he, was, he has been told, uh, that's not very practical of you. We expected you come in to be practical. What do you expect a church consultant to do other than tell you to pray? I mean, that's always the start. But, but that portrays uh, some of the state of the churches in that we, we aren't sure about the role of prayer and where it fits and, and how to do it and where to begin. And so I think it is good to come back to this, these words. If you're not quite sure where to begin with prayer, Jesus lays it out for you pretty cleanly right here. If you want to know how to pray, this is where to start. The way of prayer that Jesus teaches begins with one word, and it's a kind of crazy word because he uses the word Father. It is amazing to note how much of a difference Jesus has made in the world because you're not bothered by me saying the word Father in reference to God. And when Jesus said Father in reference to God back 2,000 years ago, that was a really big deal. Because at the time, there were two ways of prayer that had sort of developed. There was the pagan way of prayer, which was the absentee landlord way of nagging. It's like your, your stove is out at your rental apartment and you've got to call the landlord again and again and again and again to get your stove fixed. And so prayer by some of the pagan groups were view, it was viewed as a way to nag God into doing something about uh, not enough rain, too much rain, too hot, too cold, can't find good work, can't find the money to pay your work. I mean, it was a way to nag God about your problems. The, the other way that prayer was sort of being understood was um, prayer by the Jewish people was being practiced as something you did to uh, a scary God, right? The, the God of the book of Job is described as the whirlwind, right? Can you imagine? It's just like praying to an oncoming tornado, something that's powerful, that has promised to protect you, but you don't want to get too close to it because it's the tornado. It might whoop you if you get too close, right? And so in this time, prayer was either nagging God into finally doing something, or prayer was something you did uh, humbly because you were scared of God. And into this time period, Jesus begins this prayer with the word, Father, Right? And to say, Father, that's a, that's a striking shift. To name the world as created by a father who means well for us, and to address someone as father, if you call someone father, uh, 
that is a striking claim, isn't it? Right? That's a very striking claim, because what are you claiming upon them? But you are their child. Right? There's a, <laughs> there is someone... I, went to camp with this person for, for years and this, 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 I've watched this uh, young lady grow up and she calls me her second father and um, it has been a very odd thing because that's claiming something on me. Whew, right? You claim father and that, that, that's claiming a relationship. Uh, and it's not just father, right? But it's our father. It's not my father. It's our father. And as soon as you say our father, what does that make us? Brothers and sisters, right? Yeah. Isn't that an odd little thing to say? We're siblings? Ooh, that, that's, that's interesting. You know what siblings do? They live together. They love each other. They serve each other. We fight together. And oh my Lord, do we fight together. But you know, we're siblings. To say our father is to say that uh, anyone who prays this prayer is part of the family. And, and when Jesus first says our father... It was in a time period when there was us and there was them. It was, it's amazing. We, I don't think we lose track of the power of this. It talks about Jews and Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles in Scripture? Gentiles is everyone else. You're either Jewish, ethnically, by faith, and then there's everyone else. Italians, Romans, every other... It, it, it was a very us and them approach to the world. And so for Jesus to say, Our Father, anyone who prays this prayer, is now your sibling. Seriously? Yep. Seriously. Anyone who prays our Father is now family. And it moves on. Hallowed be your name. When we step out from here, we put on the name of Christian. And may we ever remember that it is Christ whose name we bear. To keep Christ's name holy, I believe, means to live up to the call of Christ to be perfect. And though we are never going to be perfect in execution, what we can be perfect is in intention and perfect in our willingness to confess and repent when we fall short. We continue on. Jesus says, your kingdom come, your will be done. Now, kingdom here. We, what do we call... A kingdom is a political entity where one person is, is in charge. What do we call that today? Dictatorship, right? We don't think of kingdom as a, a good thing. We, we don't have kingdoms anymore. What do we have? Constitutional democracies, representative de democracies. We have dictatorships. We have all these different forms of government. But the one thing we don't have anymore are kingdoms. And, and so what I would suggest to you, whenever you read the kingdom of God or kingdom in the Bible, I'd suggest you su substitute the word politics. Right? It's not your kingdom come, it's your politics come. Your way of gathering together. Right? Politics are what are the, is the word we use for how people get together and govern each other. Right? And, and so kingdom is one form of politics. And so our hope is that the politics of God happen. And politics is not some sort of abstract thing down the road. Maybe it'd be, it'll be better one day. Politics is a very meat and potatoes thing for today. And so we pray that God's will, God's politics, be done so that we might live as God has intended today. Now, if we're going to play our part in living God's politics, God's will, we're going to need nourishment, and so we pray for our daily bread, which is an impressive statement of trust, to go from praying for God's politics upon the entire world and then pray for me to have a ham sammy for lunch. Right? That, that's kind of a, it's a huge change in scope, but we're naming what, how we believe God to work. God is working at the greatest level, the po level of politics of entire nations. And God, could I have something to eat for lunch today? Right? That's an amazing statement of trust as well. God will provide for the nations and God will provide for me, for my lunch. And while we're focusing on the practical, we then move to our own relationships as well. May we be forgiven as we forgive those who trespass against us. We can't be part of God's politics of reconciliation if we're not practicing them ourselves. I don't believe that it is that we, God cannot forgive us if we, cannot, if we won't forgive others. I believe that if we're not forgiving others, we're not in a place where we can receive God's forgiveness. We're shutting ourselves off. If we're not forgiving others, then we cannot even begin to believe that God might forgive us. So forgive us our sins as we forgive those who, for, who sin against us.
Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. God does test. God tests Abraham in Genesis 22 with the sacrifice of his son. God tests Job. Jesus is tested. It is part of being human that we are tempted and tested, and so we might as well pray for help for when it happens. That's the Lord's Prayer. Right? It's a prayer that we don't have it so that we can repeat it ten times in a row, nagging God. But it's a prayer we have so it can form how we pray whenever we pray. And I am, for one, thankful for these words, for there are times when I flounder. There are times when prayer is peace and wisdom and good. Uh, there are times when prayer is confusion and absence, and I wonder if I'm spinning my wheels trying to put word next to word, and I come back to these words, and I begin again. If you're floundering and struggling with prayer, go back to the beginning of these words and use them. Use them whether you are alone or whether you are with others. Use them in the old King James, which we all know, our Father who art in heaven. You never say the word art unless it's in the Lord's Prayer, but you all know what it means. Or use a new translation, a translation that kind of shapes and, and makes you pay attention to what you're, you're actually saying. I can pray this quickly when time is of the essence and I need to get out the door. And I can pray this when I need to take some time and kind of look at myself in the mirror and pray. If I'm going to pray for the politics of God and God's will, what's that mean for my own personal politics? Ain't that a humdinger of a question? That, that's worth some prayer and some thought and some reflection right there. You know, and notice how this prayer teaches us to pray for people, not about them, to pray for their, their best, not, for, not just for my best. Ponder whether I focus, this prayer leads me to ponder on whether I focus on other people's sins instead of focusing on my forgiveness of those sins. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who trespass. I mean, whew, I, it, this is an excellent thing just to take some time with. For this, this prayer is always a good thing. It roots us in our family, turns us to our father, connects us to our siblings. It helps us trust that we'll, God will respond as a father always does. A father always listens, sometimes advises, might act, but is always there. My friends, can we be a people committed to prayer? Can we all go back to this prayer this week and make time for it? At night before bed, in the morning over breakfast, set an alarm on your phones to remind ourselves to pray. We have smartphones, we might as well use them for something. This might be a good week to spend some more time praying. This might be a good week to spend some more time speaking to God, listening to each other, avoiding debate. For the love of God, let's just stay off Facebook and let us just spend some time praying using the words that Jesus has offered us. Amen.